Good morning, everybody, and it's a real um, uh, pleasure to welcome you to um, the Levy Hume uh, Research Centre for Forensic Science annual lecture. Um, my name is Professor Neave Nick Dade. I'm the director of the centre, um, and it's a great pleasure to have Professor Lindsay Wilson Wild with us um, today to deliver our annual lecture. Um, if you want to ask Lindsay a question, uh, either during or well after um, her presentation, please put your questions into the Q and A. Um, and we'll we'll um, ask those questions on your behalf um, once Lindsay's presentation is completed. It gives me great pleasure now to hand over to Professor uh, Ian Gillespie, who is the principal and vice chancellor of the university, to formally welcome Lindsay to the lecture. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Neve, and uh, uh, welcome everyone, uh, wherever you are in the world. Um, for us here in, in, in Dundee, of course, it's morning. Uh, for our speaker uh, today, uh, Lindsay Wilson Wild, uh, Lindsay's nine and a half hours uh, ahead of us, so it's, it's evening in Australia. And I know many of uh, those tuning in to uh, this session are from uh, around the world. So wh whatever time it is, wherever you are, a very warm welcome uh, indeed. Um, this is the sixth in a series of annual lectures uh, for the Leverhulme Research Centre for Forensic Science at the University of Dundee. Uh, we're very proud of the Leverhulme Research Centre and the support that we get from the Leverhulme Trust. The centre was established in 2016 and its purpose is to address challenges in forensic science and increase the robustness of forensic evidence used in courtrooms not just in the UK, but uh, globally. And the centre takes a very collaborative approach to its work. And because of that global reach that we are looking for, uh, collaborates globally with experts uh, around various jurisdictions. And this annual lecture is a fantastic opportunity to not just look at the forensics of uh, the future of forensic science, but also to, to help us bring that uh, global partnership together. So today, as I said, we have uh, uh, a speaker, a very distinguished speaker uh, from Australia. Professor Lindsay Wilson Wild has a long list of, of uh, accolade and I won't go through all of them, but I'm going to pick up on some of the highlights. So first of all, of course, she is a professor of forensic science, but she's also the director of Forensic Science South Australia. So a practitioner as well as an academic. She's president of the International Forensic Strategic Alliance, which is a global group bringing together regional forensic science practitioner networks and three big strategic partners, Interpol, the UN Office of Drugs and Crime and our own Leverhulme Centre. So uh, Lindsay, uh, really has that academic prowess and understanding, practitioner's experience, a real global reach. She's also, I'm delighted to say, the most recent fellow of uh, our, our uh, Leverhulme Research Centre. And becoming a fellow of our centre means that there'll be an even closer relationship than there already is between Dundee and South Australia going forward. But the important thing is what Lindsay is going to be talking about, and you'll want to hear from her. It's a really, really important uh, topic that she's picked on for us today, which is how can we influence the next generation of forensic scientists to develop into empowered and responsible leaders in the justice system? So without further ado, I give you Professor Lindsay Wilson Wild. Lindsay, over to you. Thank you so much and thank you to the Human Research Centre for Forensic Science for inviting me to talk to you this uh, today evening, um, wherever you are in the world. Um, it's an absolute honour to be presenting to you today. Um, what I wanted to talk about was about global leadership in forensic science and um, this is something that's really important uh, to me and, and leadership is something that I guess has um, grown into an emerging issue and I can go back to my uh, younger days when I very first started off in forensic science 
and we had a group called which we called Smansville or the senior managers of Australia and New Zealand forensic laboratories and it was essentially a group of the laboratory directors and I remember looking to this group of awe-inspiring individuals who were absolute leaders in our community uh, forensic science community here in Australia New Zealand and I watched them um, make decisions that weren't always in their agency's best interest. Um, they advocated for the development of an accreditation uh, system. And um, it was that was why we got accreditation in Australia. And they worked together collaboratively as leaders to um, create that. Um, and I kind of wanted to, you know, that really, for me, really influenced uh, myself as a leader and who I wanted to be. And so I'm going to share my presentation now. And, and this is why um, I want to talk about Lockhart leadership. Um, this isn't necessarily a, 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 a um, discussion about leadership styles, but it's, it's about the importance of strategic and innovative le leadership. Um, to create a collaborative dynamic in forensic science that promotes the next generation le of leaders. And I look to those, those Smansville members and the amazing things that they were able to accomplish uh, for forensic science uh, by going that extra mile. It was a vocation for them. And for me, I looked to them and that was the leader that I wanted to be or the type of leader I wanted to be, um, which is important. So. I'm not going to talk about uh, leadership styles or anything like that. You can go and research that yourself. Um, this isn't about that. This is about the importance of leadership in forensic science and how we promote that next generation of leaders. And the way that I wanted to talk about it was about Lockhart leadership. Um, and Lockhart is, is something we all know as forensic scientists. Um, and there's some important learnings that we can um, utilize or gain from his uh, determinations all those years ago. We all know Lockhart's exchange principle, um, and this is what he said, you know, it's possible for a criminal act, especially considering the intensity of a crime, without leaving traces of this presence. And, and we've all, um, you know, we've all uh, shortened that down to every contract leaves a trace, and that's uh, how we tend to uh, describe Lockhart's exchange principle. But I think it's a really important thing when it comes to um, leadership in the sense of the experiences and interactions of individuals leaves traces. Um, myself as a, as a leader, I have been strongly influenced by the experiences that I've had in my uh, career and it has greatly influenced um, who I am as a leader today and you'll you'll um, understand and hear about a lot more about that through this talk. But also as a leader, I influence and I can have an impact on other people and that impacts them and who they grow to be as a leader. And this is the, the concept that I wanted to kind of explore in more detail um, and noting that you don't need to be in a director position to be a leader. You can be a leader at any level. And that's really important to know. This is about leadership at all levels and the interactions that we have as individuals between other individuals and what the impacts of those interactions will be. Now I wanted to just um, talk um, and talk about some other work exactly in this space around Lockhart leadership. Uh, Paul Kincaid, who's the founder, founder of the Selfless Leadership Group, has spoken about forensic leadership and he talks about uh, Lockhart's exchange principles and um, the traces that it leaves behind. And he's got a great TED talk on it. Um, and he talks about positive and negative traces and has a, a way of categorizing these as green and red. Um, so it's, a, it's an interesting concept uh, that he talks about. Also, Simon Park, who's the author and CEO of the Mind Clinic, um, has a great blog about a former police commander who believes that the Lockhart principle is useful beyond crime scenes. And in this blog, he talks about every time two people come into contact with one another, an exchange takes place, which is the exchange principle. And the great leaders understand not only that what they do is important, but how they do it is equally so, because 
every contact leaves a, leaves a trace. And so looking at the traces that have been placed on me as uh, in my career, um, I have been fortunate to work in a number of forensic agencies. Uh, the first one being in Victoria Police in Victoria and Australia, uh, where I got my grounding and um, all my training as a biologist. I'm a biologist by trade, uh, where I was uh, taught in crime scenes, uh, biological analysis, DNA interpretation and courts. And then I was uh, moved on to New South Wales Police and uh, was very fortunate there to have a DNA specialist position doing all sorts of things, um, including dealing with ministers and commissioners and, and people like that. And then moved on to Australian Federal Police, which is our federal sort of Commonwealth uh, overarching police agency that looks at uh, Commonwealth crime. Um, and so I worked there for a few years and then went to the National Institute of Forensic Science, which is a different kind of agency. Again, it's a common police service where I started off as direct deputy director and then became director. And then more recently, I've moved to Forensic Science South Australia, which sits in an attorney general's department, which is non-police, uh, where I am very fortunate enough to be the director. Uh, so really bringing that amalgamation of all of my um, experiences uh, together into this role. I also want to say that um, I've experienced many traces um, and they've all had an impact on me. And I talked about Smansville, those uh, lab directors that I used to look up to. And I was extremely fortunate in the course of my career to have um, been mentored by three of the Smansville directors. Firstly, on the left there, Tony Raymond, who was assistant director of the Victoria Police uh, Forensic Laboratory. And what Tony didn't know about forensic science wasn't worth knowing, uh, it can be said. And Tony had a great uh, expression, which was um, more often than not, if you give individuals an opportunity, they will rise to the occasion. And, and that's what he did for me uh, when I moved to New South Wales Police. Tony moved to New South Wales Police before me, took, took over as director of their forensic facility, and then approached me to see if I'd come and help him out there, which I did. And that's what he did. He gave me opportunities and allowed me to rise to the occasion. He was an extremely intimidating individual because of his wealth of knowledge but it made me research and um, get my facts in order and really know a topic before I say when and pitched a research um, uh, suggestion to him. I'd have to know everything. I'd have to research it because he would quote some paper from 1983 um, that it had done this. And if I didn't know that, then I would walk away with a project that wasn't approved. So he really made me a better scientist and um, a better uh, person on, the, on that leadership journey. Um, and that was, I learned a lot from him. So he left a lot of traces on who I am now. The person in the middle is a, a man called James Robertson, who was the director uh, when I worked at the AFP, the Australian Federal Police. And uh, he was very well read, but in a different way. He was strategic and broadly well, well read. And he was, he had very strong opinions that he would convey. Um, and he taught me the importance of reading broadly and thinking at that broader strategic level and really teaching me that decisions at the higher level take into account more information. And you needed to look outside of your area in order to make those decisions. And so if I wanted to get a decision up through him, I need to, to make that same consideration. So it really pushed me to think more broadly. And then the person on the right there is Alistair Ross, um, who is who was the director, previous director of the National Institute of Forensic Science. And when I was deputy director, he was the director. Uh, one of the nicest uh, people you will ever meet uh, to the extent that he could give someone bad, bad news and they would thank him for it. And I learned so much about diplomacy and how to deal with people and how to get the best out of people. 
So I really absorbed some of the traces that he left on me. Um, but there are a number of things I noticed in those days when I was um, coming up through my leadership journey. And I'll take you back to when I went to the AFP, Australian Federal Police, because that is when I took my first step into a leadership position as team leader running the biology area for the AFP. And there were things that I noticed in that process. I noticed that there were cultural overlays that impacted women in the workplace. There were different rules for men and women. Um, I remember comments about uh, I was dressing, as you can see in the picture there, in uh, pantsuits. And there was a comment that I was trying to act like a police officer or be a man and various comments like that. Um, and I noticed this, that women were talked about in a way by managers and leaders that men weren't. Um, and I remember sitting at a national meeting while a lab director, senior people, uh, where they were talking about women and the troubles they were having because someone had just got married and she was just going to go off and have babies and things like that. And just talked in a way that you wouldn't say that about a man and not in a way that is inclusive or provides other opportunities or other ways of working like we take for it um, for um, take advantage of now. And the other thing I noticed is I was often only the only woman at the table or in the room and you can see in the picture there um, I am the only woman in that picture that is in forensic science or in the AFP getting recognized at that level. And that was after the Bali bombing. And I would go to, I remember going to national meetings where we were establishing our DNA database and the rules around our DNA database. And I was the only female there. And it happened quite a lot. Um, and it was a really interesting eye opener in the way that I had to hold my own. And I remember being um, interviewed once and someone asking me, uh, who was your, who was your female leader? Who did you aspire to be? What female did you aspire to be? And I said there wasn't any. I had males and they were the people I aspired to be and I didn't see that there was a difference, um, that I was aspiring to be a leader, not a gender. Um, but it, it's been like that for a long time. Um, we can go back to 1951 when Golda Meir joined Israel's third government as the only female. We'll fast forward to 1975 when Catherine Graham was elected to the Associated Press's Board of Directors um, and she was the first woman there. But let's bring forward 2014 where we can see German Chancellor Angela Merkel as the only female person at the table at the G7 summit. And if you think it's any different, this is 2022's G7 and that's the uh, European Union's Ursula von der Leyen um, as again the only female at the table. And I guess Marion Wright Elderman put it uh, the best that you can't be what you can't see. And and I, I use this uh, description for our young and emerging uh, students and scientists and emerging leaders coming forward that it's important for them to see um, a diversity at the leadership level. And, and not just female either. And that's something I've kind of battled a little bit um, for a number of years, and I would uh, take great umbrage when we would have a, a forensic conference here in Australia, and we would have eight plenaries, and if we were lucky, we'd get one female, and the rest were male and um, culturally singular. Um, and we would have, but we would have um, theme sessions for social nights that ran to uh, convicts and wenches or gangsters and moles. So the men got to be convicts and gangsters and the women got to be wenches and moles. And I would ask, why can't we all be gangsters? And why can't we all be convicts? Why do we have to have this uh, separation? And, you know, it's it's important. We can be anything. We don't need to see it. We can need to ins inspire it. Um, and we need to mentor our um, young and emerging leaders to move up into these leadership positions. And this is where I, I strongly started to do some work in this space uh, because it became important. I looked around and um, 
When I became director of the National Institute of Forensic Science, I was the first female in Australia to actually attain the position of director. Um, and, and I thought, if I don't do something, who will? Who will look at these issues and who will strive to make a change or make a difference? Um, and that's when I started to do some work and I started to present to the Australian lab directors and I collect some initial data on diversity in our leadership cohort in Australia. And I also started to do some mentoring, both informal and formal. Formal mechanisms were outside of forensic science because we didn't have a formal mentoring process. Uh, but informally it would be, I started off just kind of saying, oh, you're going for a job. If you need any help with that or you want me to help you prepare, just let me know. Or you're going for a promotion, need any help? Let me help you. Got an issue? If you want to chat, it, chat about that issue over coffee, I'd be more than happy to. Um, so that was the mentoring and that's sort of grown and, and now I mentor a few people, both in a informal and informal settings. And I had informal discussions, uh, raising awareness and I would get the usual blame, time and fairness excuses. You know, women don't want to go up into those leadership roles or it's only a matter of time before they do or you have to be fair, you have to hire on merit and these sorts of things. And they weren't the only things. And I thought, no, this resolved uh, me to say, no, I need to do something and I need to get this discussion going and moving along. And I needed to have a big exposure and I partnered with others to get other people on side. And I did a survey looking at uh, leadership more formally in Australia and New Zealand. And I did a presentation to our um, international conference here, the Australian New Zealand Forensic Science Symposium in 2016. And this to me was a watershed moment for me personally um, in this whole leadership work that we've been doing. This is what it looked like uh, for us. Uh, the dark purple is the male and the light purple are females. And if you can look down the bottom axes, we have team members, which are your general scientists. Tier four is your team leader level. Tier three is the manager level. Tier two is either assistant director or deputy director level. And tier one are the directors. And you can see we've got a relatively not too bad even distribution. However, when it gets to the director level at that time, we had no female directors in the country when I did that survey. So it's an appalling position for us to be as a as a leadership group. Uh, there's no cultural diversity, so we couldn't. Uh, gender was kind of like the biggest issue uh, because we had just no diversity. But when you looked across all of it and you counted everybody up, we had about a 50 50 male female split across the board. And then if you broke it down into the generic kind of disciplines, uh, for electronic evidence, which is your computer, forensics, digital imaging area, um, it was predominantly um, a male dominated space. And when you got up into those higher tier leadership positions, it was 100% male. So we weren't going to uh, find our next emerging leaders um, at a director level from that cohort. Administration was fairly even across the board, uh, but it's unlikely that directors would come from that administration sector. So we're really looking for the field sciences and the laboratory sciences uh, for our emerging uh, directors. And you can see in the lab sciences there, at that tier two assistant director, director level, we were predominantly female. So there was a key area uh, that we could mentor and progress up. But even field sciences, it wasn't too far uh, removed. But if you go to tier three, again, it's very male dominated. And so we needed to uh, pay some attention to mentoring and developing within the field sciences, which are predominantly field, um, police based with crime scene fingerprints, ballistics, those disciplines. Um, so we're looking to both those field sciences and the lab sciences, chemistry, biology, um, to promote and mentor but what's going on? What's going on that we don't have um, this uh, gender diversity in particular? And one of those 
components is cultural cultural norms as an identity of who who females are and who males are and those um, rules still underpin society now uh, when we think of surgeons or firefighters we think of of males when we think of nurses and teachers we tend to think of females and it's a a bias that we often don't know we've got and it's so subconscious it just sits in that low level sort of cultural norm space um, and we're seeing a lot of this gender bias going on you know the men do the business the women take care of business and there's a great um, anecdote about the uh, US Philharmonic Orchestra who were doing their hiring and they would have the performers come on stage in front of a panel and play and what they were finding is that they were hiring predominantly males um, in that hiring process so they decided to put the performers behind a screen so that the panel couldn't see who was performing they could only hear the music that they were playing and what they found was when they did that that they would get about an equal distribution of males and females in their hiring cohort um, so that's interesting. There's a subconscious bias going on that we don't even know that we have half the time. The other thing that we often talk about is the imposter cycle. And there's this feeling that uh, women are more subjected to the imposter syndrome than males are. And it's that uh, inner critic, that anxiety and self-doubt that you're not good enough and sooner or later everybody is going to see you for the fake that you are that you're just making it up as you go along and i can tell you all this is something i suffer from i still am waiting for the point in time where everyone is going to realize i'm a complete fake and i have no clue and i'm just making it up each day um and when i was previously director of the national institute of forensic science that's what i used to tell my um, team i used to say you know you're on the cutting edge you're being innovative it's not been done before you've got to make it up and that's a good thing just make it up um, develop it create something because that's what you're doing when you're creating you're making something up and have the confidence that what you're making up um, and what you're creating is good um, and i and I still battle with this, which I find um, hilarious. And I have this roaring inner critic that will critique the way that I do just about everything, including this uh, presentation afterwards. I'll have a right go at myself later. But that keeps me at the edge. It has a good, um, a good feature because it makes me strive and want to do things better and improve. But if it gets too overwhelming, then it is negative and it can have a, a, a huge negative impact and hold you back. And um, I had a colleague who um, decided to point out every time they thought I would have my inner critic going. And it was through their efforts that really made me realize just how often I would critique myself. And it was their, their impact on me and their trace that they left behind in doing this that really made me get on top of that uh, inner critic and say no it can be there to make me better but it can't hold me back or critique me uh, in that way and so that was something i purposely went and did but that colleague was very empowering for me in the sense that she really helped me identify it and so left a, a huge uh, positive impact on me the other thing going on is equity versus equality. If we all have a level playing field, it's great, but we don't. Um, we each have issues. I um, have to go home and cook dinner. Even in my position, my children still come and they'll look to me before they'll look to my husband. It's the, the cultural overlay that we have. So it isn't a playing, an equal playing field. So we don't have equality. So we have to look to equity and we have to help those who need a little bit more help in order to have a level playing field, in order to make it so everybody can look over the fence and see uh, what's going on. And I think that's really important. So that's where we as leaders and managers need to really focus our efforts so that we can provide that equity and we can have that positive trace, leave those positive traces on 
the individuals that we can empower. So after that presentation, I got incredible feedback. Um, the number of women and men that came up to me afterwards to talk about uh, the light bulb moments that they had. And I will say I know loads of men who have imposter syndrome. So just talking about it at a forensic conference was really uh, empowering for a lot of people in order to kind of look at themselves and say, what do we want to do in that leadership space? But we had to do more. So in October 2018, as then director of the National Institute of Forensic Science, I took a concept uh, to the laboratory directors of Australia and New Zealand that we should do something. And to say that the response was less than I had hoped is probably um, an understatement. Um, in that room of lab directors, there was one female. That one female was advocating very strongly that we should be doing something in this leadership space around diversity and inclusion. And all the males were saying we didn't need to. Um, and it was an absolute eye opener and lesson in why we needed to do something because the one female was telling you, telling the group that we needed to do something and everybody else wasn't listening. And so we resolved that that uh, director and I to go away and do something anyway and come back. And I also had a few conversations with people just pointing out what had gone on and how that actually looked. Uh, so we had a few sheepish people. So the following year we went back and um, it was a different playing field. It was entirely different chalk and cheese. We had strong support that we would do something um, and they decided to look at the gender imbalance as the first issue because it's the low hanging fruit, if you like, and, and the one that's probably the most easier. So we're going to tip our toe into the leadership space of looking at diversity and inclusion. Then that was probably the one that we could tackle um, first off. And where we ended up with was the Engender Change Programme. And this was about transforming culture through leadership. And it was officially launched in October 2020. And the idea was that it would be visible. So advocates uh, or members would make a um, visible statement. And I have a certificate in my office um, and I've taken a pledge and I have a pin that you can see in the middle. And it invites others and myself to be accountable. And it's about those front of mind actions and language. It's measurable because it is actions and language and I encourage others to join so it's expandable and here at Forensic Science SA quite a number of our, our leaders and our staff have joined I am pleased to say and taken that commitment. They hold themselves to account and they can hold others to account and this is all about those traces that we have, how we interact with others, how the two individuals can come together how we behave, the language you use, and the impact that has on others. Um, and really about having that positive impact so that we can grow and empower that next generation of leaders. Lots of social media on it. And uh, there's a, um, uh, you can see there's a, if you look at the top left here, uh, a video of all of the lab directors taking this commitment, this everyday commitment, and uh, there's a website. If you just Google in gender change, you'll find it. Um, but it's really about transforming diversity inclusion culture in the forensic science community through leadership. And it's a leadership um, body about bringing the right kind of leadership that's inclusive um, leadership that promotes others through mentoring and workshops and things like that, um, but focusing on everyday actions and language. And so we can foster that sense of inclusiveness um, in all aspects of diversity and inclusion. And I think that's really important. And so the role of directors becomes really important because the um, lab directors of Australia and New Zealand have signed up. And there are things that we can do. So myself as a lab director, um, 
if my scientist, scientists at FSSA want to go to a conference, there's a form that they have to fill out. And part of that form asks whether the conference has a diversity and inclusion policy. And my hope and my request to them is that they go to the website and find out. If they don't, they need email the organisers because if we, the more people we have emailing organisers and asking them uh, whether they do, the more likely it is that they will do. And uh, I had uh, one conference who they weren't going to do it and I rang them up and they didn't and they said it wasn't important. And then about a month later, uh, the, um, the company that helped put it together contacted me to see if I would sponsor it. And I said, no, I won't sponsor it because you don't have a diversity inclusion policy. Once you have one, come back and then I'll sponsor it. Uh, and they said, well, are you going to send people? No, and I'm not coming unless you do. And uh, within a week they had one. Um, and that was that was how we can have an impact. And the more people that are holding each other to account and the more we're stepping as individuals into that leadership space to say, uh, this isn't enough. We need to have this inclusive approach. The more we as leaders, and this is a, again at any level, the more we can have an impact. Um, and if they can have a diversity inclusion policy, we'll get uh, culturally diverse speakers, gender diverse, um, LGBTQ plus inclusion, um, disability inclusion. And it's easy. Conferences should do this. They shouldn't have workshops that individuals with a disability can't get to. I remember going to one conference that had a workshop and there was no lift in the building and it was on the second floor. So luckily none of the attendants were hampered by that, but that should never have been held there because perhaps if, if a person who did have a disability might not have signed up for that workshop had they have asked where it was located. And so these things become really important and having them front of mind as us as leaders becomes important that we can then affect change. One group I'd like to talk about, and um, Ian mentioned, I'm uh, president of the International Forensic Strategic Alliance. This is a group that I'm hoping can have a real influence in this leadership space. Uh, they are a leadership group for us. Um, and essentially what this group is, all our lab directors in Australia and New Zealand um, come under an umbrella of the National Institute of Forensic Science. In Europe, for European attendees, you'll all have heard of the European Network of Forensic Science Institutes, which are the lab director, directors of Europe. America has ASCLAD, all their lab, lab directors. There's ASEF in South America and Spain and Portugal. There's a South African network. There's an Asian Forensic Science Network. These have representatives of all of these networks that come together to form IFSA, along with three strategic partners, uh, Leverhulme Hume Research Centre for Forensic Science, United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime and Interpol. And so this group has a huge reach. Um, if you look at IFSA, it totals 102 countries and 503 institutes um, or forensic service providers. So this group is a group that operates in that leadership space. Uh, they have a website and you can go to the website if you would like to know more information about IFSA. And they um, they work together and their vision is collaboration in forensic science for a safer world. And their mission is to provide strategic leadership and create opportunities for collaboration across the global forensic science community. And so this is a group that can really step forward and step into that leadership and emerging leadership space. They do a lot of work in emerging nations and putting together minimum requirements documents to help emerging nations develop forensic science capability. But this is a group that could do more in this global leadership space. And that's um, something that uh, certainly Neve and I have been talking about uh, moving IFSA into a space of doing more around that uh, global emerging leaders and uh, so I would encourage you all to look and uh, watch this space for what IFSA will be doing in the future. Um, a, a couple of, I just 
thought I'd just mention there have been a couple of articles, a few articles that uh, looks at leadership around the women in leadership, uh, women in forensic space. And as I said before, you know, going to a conference and um, there's only one female plenary. I started finding out who our local um, science chair or leader was for the um, conferences and hassling them starting about two years out saying I hope you're going to have good diversity uh, within the plenary cohort and the and the keynote co cohort for the conference and I used to get commented um, to me well there are, I don't know who to contact there aren't any female plenaries and various excuses like that so the article in the middle is an article I wrote on the merits of women um, and it talks about all of the various women in Australia and New Zealand who are amazing leaders in forensic science and all of their accomplishments. And so if now uh, a conference organiser says, well, we don't know who to ask to be a plenary, I send them this article and I say, here you go. And I remember um, one of the uh, science, uh, the scientific chair of the conference said to me, oh, Lindsay, you're just not going to be happy unless there's four female and four male plenary speakers, are you? And I said, no. I said, I'll tell you when I'll be happy. I'll be happy when there's eight plenary speakers who are all females and no one bats an eye. And it's not an unusual thing because there can be eight males and no one bats an eye. And so wouldn't it be great if there were eight females and that would be uh, fantastic. And so that's where I'd like to get to. But coming back to this Lockhart leadership and what traces have affected you. And, you know, I, I look and I've spoken about a number of the traces that have impacted me as a leader. And a good exercise is to reflect back about what bad leaders have you met? What made them bad? And then what can you learn from them? Because even if you have a bad leader, you can learn from them. and it can make you a better leader. You'll learn the things what not to do. And I spoke about my uh, three mentors from Smansville earlier, and I learned lots of things that were good from them, but I also learned things um, what not to do. Um, you know, how to, how to approach things, how to be stronger, or how, to, how not to do the things that they might do that was their, maybe their weakness. Um, and then also what good things they did. What good leaders have you met? What made them good and what can you learn from that? And from my perspective, um, the leaders that really had that impact on me and developed me as the leader I am was the leaders that encouraged me, sorry about that, and, um, and empowered me. The, like Tony Raymond said, you know, given the opportunity, more often than not, people will rise to the occasion. And so that's what I do. I allow people the opportunity to rise to the occasion, but I support them if they can't. And that's what we need to do uh, to empower our next generation of leaders. And just to reflect back, this is where we're sitting in Australia at the moment, our lab directors. We have about a third that are females that have come up since 2016. And uh, and some of these are amazing uh, women. And I'm hoping that next year um, I will be able to say that it's about a 50-50 split. So I've got fingers crossed. Um, we've got some uh, lab directors who are retiring at the end of the year. And I honestly hope that we will get uh, more diversity, even more diversity in our leadership cohort here. So my message is to leave good traces, to encourage others, to educate others. Don't be afraid to um, to talk about the things, you know, I'm a such as um, I have a raging inner critic. That's good for other emerging leaders to know. It's not a bad thing um, and enable them. Uh, give people that opportunity and let's see more of our younger cohort and our next generation uh, to emerge as the next uh, leaders 
um, as we give them that opportunity and empower them, uh, we'll see that they will grow and rise to the occasion as well, which is what I would hope to see. Thank you for listening to me. I just want to um, thank again Leverhulme Research Centre for Forensic Science for uh, allowing me the honour of presenting to you today and in particular Nick Dade who invited me um, to give this presentation. So thank you all very much. Lindsay, thank you very much indeed. If that was the awkward silence at the end that everybody's going, <laughs> what's happening now? Lindsay, huge thanks. Um, I, I knew when we discussed the topic that you were going to talk about that it was one that was very close to your heart and mine as well and, and that you would touch on um, a whole range of different aspects uh, and um, if if we were in the real world um, you would be having a huge round of applause because you 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 hit the mark and, 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 and made the brief very very well. Um, I'm going to um, take a couple of questions coming in and I, I'm going to just go through a few of those and then hand over at the end back to Ian um, to, for, for some commentary he might want to have and to, to give a formal thanks um, on our behalf at the university. Um, the, the first question um, really is, you, you've described I think very, very carefully and very well the way in which um, you um, you you created this change culture and what advice would you give to anybody who wants to start to do that what were the i mean you, you described some of the barriers and some of the boundaries and and just just what um how, how do you start it if, I, if if somebody was going to want to make the changes that you've made what advice would you give them just to kick it off excellent uh question there um look the the starting point is to uh, have conversations to find ambassadors and advocates or like minded people that can assist you. Um, so I would advise not to go it alone. Um, and it never works. And you really do need um, that a critical cohort, I call them. Um, of uh, those like minded people who will advocate with you um, and uh, approach uh, the leaders and um, and down as well into the management sector and start by having conversations. That's where I would start. Um, but I would strongly advise that you have a healthy dose of perseverance um, because it is not a quick change. Um, you'll notice some of the dates there where I actually first started talking about this in, I would say somewhere around 2014. And, and gender change was launched in 2020. So it was a six year journey um, and you need to take the community and I always talk about taking the community on a journey and you start by moving in small steps and having conversations, um, presentations, not accepting no and finding who your ambassadors are in the, in the community and be saying the same thing and supporting each other and slowly but surely moving your community forward. Um, it's interesting to, uh, to look at what the appetite is for change. When you get to the decision point where they are, they say, okay, we need to make a change, we need to do something, and you're in that spot, and then looking at what their appetite is. I took uh, various options to the lab directors, right from just having a few workshops and by the time we got them into that that change, that mindset change, that cultural change, they went all out into that engender change. And that shocked me. Um, it really did. I didn't actually envisage I would get that uh, particular option up and on the table. And so and, and to be honest, um, I'd say a healthy part of that was was, sh was probably naming and shaming, uh, not publicly, but you know, in the, you know, did you realize you said this um, kind of thing in a nice kind of way? 
Um, and so just pointing, pointing things out of behavior and attitudes actually went a long way, particularly when it was them. And I, I remember um, one lab director before I went in that first time in 2016 or 2018, sorry, I had a conversation with a lab director about it to, you know, just to, you know, get an advocate on board. And they said that they'd gone to a meeting with their partner, their wife, and everybody spoke to them and never to their wife. And their wife talked about it later and said that she felt excluded. Even when she asked a question, they would respond back to the husband. And he made her a commitment that he would look out for that in future. And he was one of the lab directors was that at that table against the one female arguing that they didn't need to do anything and he didn't notice. And he so I pointed out to him afterwards and I said, do you remember that story you told me about your wife? Did you notice at that table what went on? And I pointed out and he's like, oh, my God, I made a promise to my wife. And the first time I'm tested, I failed. I completely failed. And I said, well, there's a lesson. You need to step up your game. <laughs> and next time when we went in that 2018, he was all on board to do something. And so. It's a long journey. You need those advocates and you need to start having conversations. Uh, uh uh, I couldn't agree with you more um, and, and a related question um, um, from Julio. I hope I'm I'm pronouncing your name correctly, um, which was a question relating to LGBTQIA plus and inclusivity within that community where um, it's not uh, the, the people's sexuality um, and indeed their gender identity may not always be public information. So how do we work towards making um, you know, our space is more inclusive without endangering privacy. Yeah, that's um, uh, that's a difficult one because you can't um, you can't invade someone's privacy. Um, but what you can do is make sure you've got um, a, that try and promote that level playing field. And even if um, so, what I've just introduced at uh, Forensic Science SA is um, uh, the use of pronouns and um, giving an option to staff to add into their email signature block, for instance, um, he, she, or and and or sorry, he, her, him, her. I'm doing this wrong. He, him, <laughs> she, her, um, etc. To so people can signal their support for their LGBT, um, uh, LGBTQ plus community, um, and just saying, you know, we're here to support you. Giving staff an opportunity to do that is one way. Um, and um, and yeah, so it, it's, a it's, it's a difficult one, that one. It's a good question. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, none of those things should be barriers. And, uh, you know, and again, it comes down to that everyday actions and language. We need to watch the language we're using. We need to look at our actions as leaders. Um, we need to make sure that we're using the right words um, and encouraging wherever we can. Fantastic. And I know after I, I did that um, pronoun uh, use, I had a number of individuals come up to me afterwards to say, you know, thank you. Um, and so it's just about setting that scene that this is an inclusive workspace. Super. I'm just I'm keeping one eye on the clock. Um, there's there's a, a number of other questions here that um, I'm, I'm going to um, maybe bring one or two of them together. Um, and one it was about um, uh, looking at the whole question of imposter syndrome. Um, I know, like you, I have a, 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 a super critic in in the inside of my mind that that keeps challenging me around um, imposter syndrome. So uh, we, we, we've spoken about that together before. How do you what's the biggest challenge? How do we how do we get beyond that imposter syndrome feeling? It's you know, uh, the well, I, I can tell you my my um, my experience is probably a good way to answer the question. My inner critic got so bad and it wasn't it was probably only a couple of years ago now that it got really bad, but I hadn't realized how bad it had got. And I went to this um, uh, workshop and as I said, I was telling the story about my uh, colleague who started pointing it out to me. 
And it was at the point where we had a residential for a week and I was saying goodbye. And I said goodbye to a colleague and kind of just stood to the side as others were coming up. And I remember someone came up and said goodbye to the same colleague. And in my head, I started going, oh, that was such a much better goodbye than mine. Theirs was way more genuine. My goodbye was crap. And my co this colleague came up to me and said, oh my God, you are in a critiquing yourself about how you said goodbye. I know what you're, I can see it in your head. I can see it in your face. You're critiquing how you said goodbye. And I just went, oh my God, she's right. I was, I was, that's ridiculous. That is utterly ridiculous. It's gone too far. And so it was that realization of just how far and how bad it had got. And I thought, no, I've got to stop. And so now when I in a critic myself and I can feel it getting a little bit worse, I go, no, you've got to stop. No one will know it's all fine. Um, you know, you've got to have the confidence in your own ability. So you have to hold it yourself. You have to hold yourself to account for your inner critic yeah. and yeah. just say yeah. and say no. Yes, I know. Not always an easy thing to do. Um, I'm going to, um, I know there's a number of other questions and we're not going to get to them all, but I, I want to bring in um, Ian just to, um, our principal, just to to say a few words and then to, to bring um, the, the lecture to a close. For those of you whose questions we haven't got to, I think, Lindsay, you might be able to write a, a set of answers if, you, if you're so inclined, um, and we'll certainly make sure that you get the questions so that we, there can be a response within the chat of this meeting. Um, Ian, can I hand over to you now? There might be just a slight delay while you go to live. There you go. Fantastic. Well, uh, uh, Lindsay, um, uh, thanks so much. Uh, I think imposter syndrome is uh, well. I think in men, it's 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 not common enough. And uh, I speak as 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 a, a quite middle aged, and that's me being generous myself, uh, man myself. Um, uh, I'm you're hugely um, uh, in admiration of what you've done to enable and encourage really talented people to uh, populate the services that you work in. Uh, there's a, a a number floating about in the economic assessment of um, uh, of gender inequalities in the workplace in Scotland which equates to something like if if women were given the same chances that men were, they'd be put, put six billion on the national economy. And, you know, that's a staggering number. And and you know, I don't like to monetize things, but it does, does kind of prove a point. You know, we have talent throughout, obviously, all of our, our population on a gender basis, on uh, a basis of, of race, uh, a basis of... Um, uh, uh, a range of protected characteristics. Let me not try and look through all of them. What, what we need to do, all of us, is take responsibility as leaders to enable the empowerment, the advancement uh, of all that can contribute. And you know, for me, uh, all women, all um, uh, BAME, all whatever. I mean, for me, the key thing is that we are genuinely, genuinely uh, en enabling uh, that capacity to deliver with equity and with inclusion. And equity and inclusion are two of the the key elements of, of our uh, newly launched strategy here at Dundee. So I can't think of uh, a better conversation uh, around the future of, of leadership in the forensic sciences and beyond than taking that equity and inclusion lens, the, 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 the one that you've brought to us today. Um, I mean, you, you, you've talked about uh, uh, constant enforcement, constant reminders, having to step up, it being a long journey. And I recognise all of them and, and absolutely agree with them. Uh, but, but there's no question that I say this as a white middle-aged man, we have to do better. And I think you've inspired us uh, today to look inwards, not just uh, as individuals, but within our organisations and how we, we can do better. So uh, a huge, huge thank you. A huge thank you from all of us 
uh, both in the, the Learville Human Research Centre, I'm delighted you're a fellow, and we'll, we'll be seeing more of you. Uh, a huge thank you from everyone uh, uh, on, on the call, and apologies we didn't get to all of the, the questions. A huge thank you from our university and from me personally, in really picking and, and shining a light on uh, a, a challenge, but an incredible opportunity for all of us. Lindsay, thank you very much indeed. And I'll pass back to you now for closing words. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Ian. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for giving us an hour of your time. Yeah. Lindsay, huge thanks. We'll be seeing each other soon. Um, and uh, with that, I'll bring um, this to a close. I want to thank equally Clara um, and Heather in the background who made all of the technology um, work, of course, and indeed all of my colleagues uh, uh, um, and friends within the Living Human Research Centre for Forensic Science. Um, thank you very much. And we'll send you away to your evening, Lindsay. Thanks hugely. Thank you. Bye now. <laughs>